And it's very much like the analogy of living in the present moment. Like when Abraham Maslow studied the self-actualizing people, he found that they were so in the moment, that they were so in the joy of the moment, that there was no split between means and ends. So, for example, an artist painting was not thinking, uh, wonder how this painting will turn out uh, in the future. Uh, I wonder if I can sell it. I wonder how much money it would bring. I wonder if it will go down in history. <laughs> but, you know, all these thoughts involving time, they're just in the joy of the moment. Of the, here's the paint coming out of that canvas and, it, canvas, and it's just joyful with no sen sense of future end. And that's, I think, what you're describing with that metaphor, where if you have a gift or ability that kind of washes through you and flows through you, and you're not looking uh, for any attention, to draw any attention to a personal self, then that's where the bliss is. And also that's where the contentment is. You know, for me, uh, I, I love it with traveling with the gatherings and stuff like that because to me it's one continuous gathering. I don't, we may put times and say this one starts at, at two and ends at six, but for me it's all the same. It just goes on and on. I'll probably end up maybe going out to dinner with people after this and we'll have a good laugh somewhere. And then uh, continually it just goes on and on, whether I'm waiting in a train station or a plane station. Um, it, it, you don't segment life into spiritual times and uh, everyday mundane uh, routine things, you know. You don't make that distinction because you're just radiating your gift of joy and your happiness. When I was just in Spain, they kept, you know, saying, you know, well, do you, do you recommend that the people read A Course in Miracles? I said, oh, no, that's not my job. I could care less uh, whether they read A Course in Miracles. I said, my job is to be happy. And then if somebody happens to pick something up like a course and says, oh, I've got some curious, i got some questions here about this, and they ask me, I'll be glad to, to talk and to answer them. But you, you become... Uh, it kind of fits in with Kathy's question, too, about this idea of beliefs. Like, if, if somebody believes something and they start questioning you, the more you go into this transformation, you realize that this whole world is a world of beliefs, and that nobody's beliefs are, are correct. Uh, because it was made to be a world of separate belief systems, where every human being that walks this earth, whatever, six billion, each seem to have a different belief system. They may have certain ones that have a lot in common, but I'll guarantee you even soulmates will have disagreements about perceptions and beliefs. They may go for weeks or months or even years, but there will come a time when one soulmate will turn to the other and say, you believe what? <laughs> I thought I knew you. <laughs> uh, because that's what this world is. No two people see the same world. I mean, that's how the ego set it up, and that's why there's so much conflicting belief and, and arguments, is because no two people see the same world. But the good news is, is the Holy Spirit sees a forgiven world, and the Holy Spirit's in your heart, in your mind, and always accessible, saying, come join with me, come up here above the battleground, and I'll show you how lovely it is. And that in any instant, we can always join with our higher self, and feel the bliss, and non-attachment, and peace, that comes from being lined up with that higher self. And after a while, it becomes more attractive to do that. In other words, you start to say, what else do I have to do with my time uh, but join with my higher power? I mean, why try to go against the, the ocean and build a sandcastle when the ocean's going to come wash, wash it away anyway? Why, why not join with the waves or, <laughs> you know, get into the flow of that? So, that's, those are good questions that we're looking at here, because what I'm saying is the more you get into the experience, the more it, everything is like you're on autopilot and you're just in this grand flow. And people, like what Kathy was saying, what do you do with those situations? I thrive on those situations. Uh, I've had, mm -hmm. Kathy no, like, would I, did, I enjoyed, I have to say there was a part of me that enjoyed it because yeah. I, I enjoy the course. I feel yes. the love. I, I want to extend the joy. And I certainly didn't want her to feel threatened in any way, shape, or form. And I was, I'm in a stranger's home, and she's asking me, you know, in a kind way, can I ask you some questions? Probably from the standpoint of trying to save me. <laughs> We're all saved. There's
there's no one that needs to be saved. We all are in the mind of God. We've never left the mind of God. But you can't help but notice people's reactions to those ideas. And, and I, I left that situation in recognition. Well, I did. I recognized the parts of my mind that needed to be healed. She was just a reflection of my own mind, and I blessed her, and I forgave myself, and that's all that needed to happen. That's it. I mean, it was, a, it was not a, everything happens for a reason. That was okay. So it really was, it really was a perfect experience. It was a perfect experience. It's very good, too, because it's, it's like a version. There's a course workbook that says, I will step back and let him lead the way. And the course is experiential. It really is a practical one. If we practice it, everything that comes our way, okay, <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. And I definitely tried to find the common ground. I mean, when she would say um, things, I would be like, oh, of course I believe in Jesus Christ. And of course I think the Bible is a book of love. And of course, you know, I tried to be as... You know, extending as I possibly could, but you know, she gave me point blank questions, and I shared my, my answers. <laughs> and you're just like looking at something, and they're like in horror over over what you're saying. So it was also something that you noticed as well. I was going to say that the Holy Spirit has led me back to the Course in Miracles, and I didn't. Well, I opened it to the first page, of course, of I Am Not a Body, because I've had a, numer a number of uh, physical ailments that I have, by the grace of God, overcome, and I have let them go, and I have been led to books. I can, a book will just almost jump off the shelf at me, which will be just exactly what I'm looking for about letting go. And there's a little book of letting go by Hugh Prather, I guess the kind of say his name, who's a, a former minister, but it's very much about being honest. And I don't think he mentions a course in your course in it, but um, it's totally in line with course teachings. And there's another uh, book that I came across just recently called The Disappearance of the Universe, and I'm wondering if anybody in here had, had seen this book by Gary. I forgot the I find that extremely amusing and also enlightening. Um, and I can open this to a certain one, but I went back to when you <coughs> said, when I felt that I needed to go back, I got my original books and uh, I just opened it to that one. I will step back and let him lead the way. You know? And so. I've opened it to that one and uh, the one about judgment. You know. And um, so instead of going through it one at a time, I have just opened the book and it's always been exactly what I was looking for, exactly what I wanted, what I needed to hear. And it's like this is a lesson that I came to learn. And God has provided me this opportunity to learn it. And it was right funny that I had an experience <laughs> uh, calculated it, both of them, you know. The heck, why couldn't they get the thing done? And also, this is something that I picked up from one of these books that I had been reading, is that um, it could be reflecting something that you have in your past, some shadow that's inside of you. And so it dawned upon me that I have at times misplaced a bill or something or other and I was searching madly for this bill. So I thought, they just being a mirror to me of what I, I have attracted that which I <laughs> don't want, you know. And so I started to laugh. And so I said, uh, Ron, come here and let me hold your hands. And I said, look into my eyes and say with me, I'm the beloved child of God. He did. He said, yeah, I'm the beloved child of God. I said, and so is everyone. And, and he said, and so is everyone. And I said, um, and um, I claim my inheritance now as God's beloved child for guidance, and I release 
it's all negatives, no matter what. And he said they swim in, we both laughed and hugged each other. <laughs> it was wonderful. It's that moment of surrender. No matter what the, however the situation was set up, when you just reach a point where you can right. look and say, this is nuts, right. this is really <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I'm making myself upset for over nothing. Then. Right. And I thought, what a sense of humor God has. He gives me two opportunities to forgive. Yeah. And so then I called Tessa, the girl. I went home and she had put the check in my mailbox when I got home. So they were both there. But I told Tessa the story. I said, you know, you know, I appreciate the lessons that uh, evidently I came to this earth to learn, as Carolyn May says, we do come to learn lessons. We have a sacred contract. So apparently one of the things I came to learn was I am not a victim. That's another thing that I love out of the course. I'm not a victim of the world I see. <laughs> yes. So I was feeling like a victim that they had not done their part <laughs> on time, you know, and so forth. And Holy Spirit gave me double opportunity. <laughs> Do you see my goofiness? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what true, I mean, the word gets passed around a lot in this world mm -hmm. called abundance, but true abundance is really just being, being in the present moment, being content, knowing all is well, uh, knowing that you're safe. Uh, you know, at the beginning, you know, I went through lots of those kind of experiences, just lots of them, lots of them. Because you have to let go and you have to see the, see the blessing. There's a blessing in every single encounter. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of fun because once you get confident in that and you're in the flow of that, things happen to me like a woman was supposed to pick me up in, in Munich at the train station and her car broke down and didn't get there. So I was in a sea of, of people uh, that I don't speak the language, just going around looking into people's eyes and enjoying uh, the, the encounters until... Um, I finally I was guided to go back to the train station where, or the train where the train had been, and the person who was supposed to pick me up was there, but I recognized this other woman, and she was like in deep prayer because she was the one that had been told to come and pick me up instead, and there she was praying, Heavenly Father, I've lost David. I missed him at the train. He's he's here in in this big train station now, and it was my responsibility uh, to pick him up and and. Bring him to me. Please, Heavenly Father, bring him to me. So I saw her and came over and just tapped on her shoulders. Praise <laughs> God for the miracle. Uh, you know, I thought I'd lost you and this and that. But, you know, it gets to be fun. You know, everything, you, you can't get lost. You can't be in the wrong place. You know, you, uh, I was at a dinner in uh, the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa with all these people, most of who just, they just spoke Spanish, and they were having all these Spanish conversations, and I was sitting there happily eating my meal, looking at all the smiling faces and the gestures and the way the hands over there gesticulate, you know, all the messages and everything. I was really enjoying the whole thing. And later on, this woman said to me, you know, it must, don't you feel like alienated or isolated when you're at a whole table of people and, and they don't uh, speak your language? They're just giving you there are all these symbols and sounds that you don't even understand. I said, oh, no, heavens. I, I was thoroughly, I said, I thoroughly enjoyed that, uh, that whole dinner. And it's because I said, that's the way it is for me all the time. I really don't, even when I travel across English-speaking nations, most of this talk is like chit-chat and gossip and everybody's talking about the same old, same old, you know. And I'm just kind of tuning into the presence of, of love. It's there, and uh, even now when I pick meditation tapes, I, I'll pick uh, pick them in other languages, so I don't even try to follow the words. I just enjoy the, the rhythms and the sounds and everything like that. So it, it's a different way of orienting your mind instead of trying to follow all these gyrations of the ego, which will drive you nuts if you try to follow it and figure it out. It's more you just relax into this presence and. Intuitively, you, you let that guide you about where you're supposed to be, <coughs> what you're supposed to say, or if you're just supposed to smile. Because a smile is like a universal symbol. I can go into a lot of countries and just smile and laugh. I, I enjoy the smiles and laughter because you feel the connection. And we don't need to always uh, have deep conversations. Uh, we just need to feel the presence of love in our heart and, and let the Spirit use the words if there are to be words spoken. 
like to go back just for a second. It's Kathy, right? Yes. We are speaking of her encounter with a fundamentalist Christian, and frequently uh, Seventh-day Adventist <coughs> fundamental Christians are oriented to have a platform, and they want to present their platform. That's their agenda, is to put their platform out in front of you to get you to vote on it one way or the other. And, you know, if you're oriented to the, the platform uh, concept, then you've got, even in basic things like families and corporations and partners and whatever, when you lift those things up as like things in and of themselves, they can become idols, you know, where you become so attached to that that you feel like you've got to protect those things and guard those things and put so much energy in. And what I think we're learning from the Course is really it's an unlearning. It's letting all that stuff flush up and let it come up because you've got to go through the darkness to the light. Without judging, oh, I'm a failure, or I'm not doing this course well, or I'm not going to be spiritually successful, let it all come up. And then, that's what my journey has been, it's like, let it all come up. I kind of would even look into my mind and say, hey, what's still down there? Come on, come on, are you hiding in the dark spot? Come on, over there, come on. I mean, you, you, you actually encourage it. Uh, to the point that you realize that you're never going to be peaceful always unless this darkness, this unconsciousness is allowed to, to come up. And then when you really get into it uh, and you really start to get to the light at the end of the tunnel, then you start to approach what I would say the curriculum of A Course in Miracles is, which is overlooking error. Not seeing the error, judging the error, analyzing the error, uh, uh, still saying what I'm doing, or saying, look at those attack thoughts, I did it again, but actually reaching a point where you've gone so through those dark clouds that you reach that point that Jesus talks about in the Song of Prayer where it's in italics, do not see error. Do not see error. Uh, most of the Course is, is, a, is taking a look at what you believe. And that's most of the books that are written about the Course are taking a look at what you believe. Most of the writings that I've written for the last 13 years are questioning what you believe and taking a look at what you believe. But I have to say now, coming into the light, that all of that was, was just like the preliminary. That the actual curriculum is getting into the joy of purpose, where you literally become so right-minded, so focused, so single-minded, that you are, you are not going to see the error. Your mind becomes so unified that you're not looking for scraps anymore of, of differences. You become so clear that love is content and not form that you're not looking for those differences anymore. And, and because what would be the point? If you're unified, you've got no need to call forth witnesses and evidence in the world anymore. And to me, that's why I say the Holy Spirit needs happy learners. That's what the joyful experience is. And that's really what this is all about, is to become so single-minded and so focused that you, you don't notice anything like that anymore. In fact, you get so into the joy that you absolutely, positively cannot have a problem. Uh, I've been telling more lately, my recent gatherings have been more of my Mr. Magoo stories. Uh, like, um, one time, not too long ago, I think it was in, I was in Pennsylvania and I was driving along in this a car, a friend Rustin had a car that she had donated to our foundation that had a bad gas gauge, so the car would run out of gas when it got about to the halfway uh, point, halfway full. But I hadn't used that car for months and months, because I was traveling all over and everything, and so I just hopped in the car and, and took it uh, to drive to the East Coast to do this gathering, not remembering anything about the gas gauge. So I was driving along in Pennsylvania, and I was up, we just got into a mountain, and started to come down off this high place on the highway and Kathy was on the cell phone talking and the car just started sputtering and sputtering and sputtering and I'm just looking at it and it's sputtering and sputtering and she's just talking away on the cell phone and, and finally the engine just kicked off and uh, so there's no engine and so the car starts to slow down so I pull over to the right lane. It's a highway but I'm going, it's down a mountain. So I'm, I'm coasting down the mountain I'm just kind of looking at the car, probably like Mr. McGoo, like, I haven't a clue what's going on, but it's still working. <laughs> she's still on the phone. She doesn't even notice that she's just still talking. Oh, this is fine. It's like a hang glider or something. Like, she's still drifting. 
And this car was losing some. We weren't going 65. We were losing a little bit of speed, but not much. So I just continued to drive and drive with it. And then we came down, and then there was an exit. And so I said, ah! So I pulled up the exit. But this was one of those exits that curls around like this. And then there was a little stop sign, but I just kind of cruised past the stop sign. And then, then there was a road, and the road kind of curled down. It continued to go down. down. So I just cruised along, <laughs> like I was in an amusement park with one of those little cars. It was this fun cruising along, and then I came to a gas station. And I pulled into the gas station, still at this point, unaware that I was out of gas. Uh, still. Uh, if I was aware that I was out of gas, I would have pulled right up in front of the pump. Uh, you know, but I didn't. I pulled right over to the side, and I got out, and I just kind of looked at the car. And then I went inside, and these people came out, and they said, well, get back in the car, we'll push you. They pushed me around to one of the pumps, and they said, maybe you're out of gas. And they put gas in the car. And there was a family, a man and his wife and kids that were staying there. And he was looking at me during this whole thing, because I was kind of sitting there with big, wide eyes, real clueless. And I could read his lips. He's saying, you ran out of gas at a gas station. I could read his lips. And he, was, he had this funny like, smile on his face, like, what, what luck you must have to run out of gas. And at that point, it dawned on me, it's like, Oh, and the first thought I had was, can't even run out of gas anymore. <laughs> you know, it was like that feeling like, that's the way it goes. When you get more unified in spirit, you can't make a mistake. You can't, there can't be a problem. Uh, it's just holy encounters. Uh, you're taken care of. Uh, you can't, you can't screw it up anymore, you know. But that's what this, that's what the curriculum of the course is about, is aiming your mind to the point where you're so... Uh, into the spirit, that you're oblivious of error. Because darkness and light can't coexist. Even the Bible said, perfect love casts out fear. That's where this course is aiming. That's where Advaita Vedanta, where all of the spiritual work that we do in the East and the West and everything is aimed at this state where you're in a state of, of happiness and bliss and joy and you're just enjoying the ride. Uh, it's a happy dream instead of uh, an up and down dream. And so that's why we come together, because it's a time saver, so to speak. We can really join together and we can discuss this weekend, this week, topics like uh, relationships and topics like sickness and uh, anything, finances, uh, scarcity, you know, anything that seems to be an issue, uh, including time. If you, know, if you just feel a stress about time, like there's not enough time in the day or not enough time in the week, it could be anything that's on your heart. I say bring it up and we'll look at it together. And the more we really are able to do that, it's like it, it gets funnier and funnier, like that story we've been telling. It just gets lighter and lighter and lighter. Because you can see that, that there's really not a real problem if you really go with this all the way. You see that all your problems have already been solved. And that's what we're here for, is to really have that experience. David, in baseball they have a, a stretch inning at seven. Yes. I just stretch for a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> seven inning stretch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea. Well, that's a salesman always does <laughs> <laughs> Quick. Gotta be quick. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you got a little taste of what we do. Uh, this is the kind of thing we'll be doing all week, whether we're here in sessions. Did you make the announcement too uh, about during the week? Well, we're not sure. We're not sure. Yeah. yeah. They're scheduled to be here, but there's a possibility we may be meeting in a clubhouse um, too. So we'll we'll let you know tomorrow uh, about how that goes. And if you come and we're not here, we will make sure and have a note either down in the lobby or you know, on the board down there, so that. Know where we are. Well, we're going to be here for sure tomorrow mm -hmm. for both sessions and possibly a Monday morning session because uh, they're going to be using uh, in place uh, possibly Monday morning. But maybe starting Tuesday afternoon or Monday afternoon is the condo. Okay, we'll be spontaneous and flow and see where the spirit <laughs> yeah. guides us and directs us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, David, uh, for some reason, I like group meditation. 
start power from the individual meditation. And Neil Donald Walsh in book three, I think, he was, yeah, here, here. He was Neil Donald Walsh in book three was channeling uh, highly evolved beings uh, don't have to use oral speaking. I mean, they're just psychic. You know, they just, you know, without speaking, they can conduct most of their lives, apparently. And that'd be like, you know, Lemuria, Atlantis, and other planets. Uh, so I just wanted, you know, like, when we sat down here, before anybody started speaking, to me that was like real powerful. And then uh, only one of my Course in Miracle groups does group meditation. I, that's the best thing for me. But how close are we to getting to nonverbal communication? You know, Neil Donald Walsh in channeling, he doesn't, he calls this primitive, this, you know, but there's nothing wrong with being primitive. <laughs> it's not a judgment when he says it's primitive. But I think we're getting closer to nonverbal communication. Yeah, that's definitely the direction where it's all moving more to, I might say, a telepathic harmony. And uh, even books that have been around for years, like uh, Marlon Morgan's Read the Message Down Under, are kind of shows you that, that what seems to be an advanced civilization in this world with, with lots of technology and cell phones and computers and whatever, uh, and lots of privacy and secrecy still, security on you know phones and laptops and so on and so forth, is really, uh, when you get into the spiritual journey, it's inverted. Because the whole point is to become more trusting, uh, to realize that there are no secrets and there are no thoughts that can be kept private that basically when you get tuned in with your source, that everything that you think and say and do is in alignment with that source, and it's for everyone. So you want to just let it fly, let it fly, let it shine, and you're not being selective in terms of who you tell what and so on and so forth. It's more just doing that. So, uh, yeah, we can, during this week we have so much time, uh, that gong that was rang uh, came from a New York City, I did a gathering in Queens recently, and uh, they were, I was going to be there for about a week, or rather about the same time I'm going to be down here. And they said, let's, let's build in some group meditations. Uh, and uh, we want to go buy a gong in Chinatown. <laughs> and I said, fine, that's fine. We've never used the gong before. But <laughs> in fact, your healing thing is Qigong, right? <laughs> uh, in fact, in the workshop, you should do a Qigong every hour. We should call it the Qigong. <laughs> yeah, it's not every hour. It's a ten minute meditation. Yeah, the gong. So here we are. I mean, we, we can, we've got a week to use in different ways. And uh, music, it could be flute music. It could be, uh, we've got lots of CDs. Uh, music's been very important in my journey. I know up at Endeavor they use a lot of music too. Uh, a lot of it, just like music, tends to go right to the heart, uh, you know, right to the core of things. Um, the words can be very helpful, and when you give them over to the Holy Spirit, open communication, uh, looking at things, can be very helpful. That's why even the Course is uh, 1,200 plus uh, words used by the Holy Spirit to kind of guide you towards a silent mind, towards a mind that can be telepathic and tuned in, um, that literally goes beyond the words, and the lessons are really aimed at, at doing that. So yes, uh, and how close are we, uh, in terms of a, the entire world and the society, uh, there are many more words that will be used, <laughs> uh, seemingly for years, in the sense that it's really letting the Holy Spirit smile through you, speak through you, hug through you, uh, letting yourself be like a transparent instrument, kind of like St. Francis's prayer, make me an instrument of thy peace. Uh, it's, I would say for a lot of people that have done it for many years, um, I always tell people that the two fastest ways to flush the ego up uh, from the unconscious into awareness are silence and relationships. Uh, if any, that's why when the monks and the nuns go off to these uh, like cloistered monasteries and have, seem to have all these psychological problems and all this rage comes up and whatever, the silence is like acts as kind of like stirring the mind, the unconscious up, and bringing to the surface so much of this repressed and suppressed darkness. And I think most people know as relationships go, if you you really get involved in a lot of committed relationships, it's like it's, it's in your face. 
uh, the stuff just comes up, and the temptation to project um, and to blame can be just intense. Um, Carrie and Jeffrey aren't with us now, but they've just got married on February 7th, and their relationship has been uh, just, the ego is just coming up everywhere. It's very volatile. It's, uh, at times, you can be oversensitized, and you need to step back and pull back from it. Uh, but I would say that um, it really depends. It's more of an individual thing about how close you are uh, to the point of the course where he says, our use for words is almost over now. Uh, you'll know intuitively uh, when you start to, to feel less and less of a need to speak uh, as you go through your life. It's more of a watching kind of thing. And there's nothing going wrong when your mind reaches that state. And it's very individualized. It's hard to make a stereotypical kind of judgment about that for, for everyone. So. Could we have a group meditation right now? Yeah. If everybody could. Yes. That sounds to me like a nice idea. Yes. We could do a, like a 10 minute group meditation right now in the sense that we've just come back from stretching and, uh, you know, just take a few deep breaths and relax in your chair and uh, experience the like chair. <coughs> Hand gestures. <laughs> uh, I used to do meditation pretty regular a few years back. And uh, even this experience that showed me how much I kind of yearned for this a little bit. It's, so, how did this say it's like I want to do meditation now in the morning, being cold? Yes, it's very helpful to be a great reminder that way. And as you keep working with the course or whatever the path is that you follow, you find that that's the direction of the mind. So you can find yourself going through regular activities and noticing during the day, mm, this looks like a nice spot to take five or ten minutes here or there and then do more spots of five or ten minutes. And it's, it's more that your mind naturally gets eased into it. It's, it's better to go that way as you do the inner training and, and work with releasing the judgments because, you know, if you would try to do it just as a goal, try to do so many minutes or hours a day and you encounter resistance, it's better not to fight yourself. You know, just to be very gentle with yourself and ease into it. Uh, in the early years when I went off to hermitage experiences, I had a lot of expectations about how many hours I would meditate. And uh, the ego was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see if you do that. And, <laughs> And you know, you can't fight it, otherwise it just, just seems to spawn more resistance. But as you keep about your, your spiritual practices, then it's almost like your mind gets more and more ready to take more and more of those periods. And uh, I think the symbol of a group meditation is just kind of like the symbol of, okay, I'm not in this alone. Because a lot of times people mm -hmm. feel that way when they do group meditations. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's such a, like, uh, like out in the left field kind of experience when you're sitting around with a whole group of people and you're all going through the experience together. So in that sense, it's a very helpful symbol for the mind. But isn't it also a practical benefit in experience and more, like Christ said, when more people are gathered? It's noticeably different than, I think, it's the vibration that starts getting magnified because they're resonating off each other. You can feel it if you do a lot of group meditations and you actually come together uh, for that purpose. Uh, I know there have been people in course groups that have actually decided that that's what they want the course group to be. <laughs> it's actually meditation a group. meditation group with uh, some sharing of experiences because a lot of times there could be lots of talking and lots of uh, bantering around. And um, I did a group in um, Florida one time, I think it was Panama City where uh, I went to the Unity Church and um, 
I was sitting with everybody, we had a big lunch there, and I was sitting, and this man sat across from me, and he said, I hear you're doing a gathering later in the week. I would really like to attend and participate in that gathering. And I said, oh, Fred, come, come. The whole table groaned uh, as I offered this invitation uh, to Fred. And I was like, what? What? I just invited him to the, to the course group, and they said, well, and he says, ah, I won't come if it's going to be such a bother for everyone and everything. So we kind of explored it at this lunch table. Apparently Fred was a professor uh, of philosophy uh, at the local university. And he would show up at the course meetings and have all these deep ontological questions which the people could not answer <laughs> and felt very uncomfortable every time Fred showed up and asked his questions. Like about judgment, like how, how practically do you live in this world without making judgments? Uh, you know, he wanted to, to explore that. So everybody groaned because they perceived that he was a, uh, uh, a distraction. Uh, they really didn't want him at the course meeting, but I was saying, no, please come and to the gathering and show up. And he did come, and the first half of the gathering, he was completely quiet because he, again, didn't want to be disruptive. But then afterwards, uh, during the break, he said, I really do have questions about judgment and about a lot of things. And I said, you ask your questions. I said, this is for everyone, and this is what we encourage, uh, going deep and, and getting deep into questions. You ask any question you want. You ask as many as you want. So the second half of the gathering, he cut loose with launching into these questions. And I don't know what all came out of my mouth, but the whole energy of the whole place went way down. It was almost like the spirit of love just completely descended on all of us. And everybody, by the end of the gathering, there were no more words. Everybody was eye-gazing, uh, just looking around and, and looking into everybody's eyes with such recognition and such deep peace and love. And the dog, who, who regularly attends the course meetings, uh, was looking up at everybody with these real twinkly eyes, kind of like, now this is the experience that I'm in every week, and you guys banter this stuff <laughs> you know. Theologically and conceptually, I mean, the dog was really had to look on his face like, like this, now you're getting it. <laughs> the first time, and it really did look like that. I mean, the dog was giving everybody to look like, kind of like, and so, and that's what we're aiming for. We're not aiming for, you know, bantering concepts around and this and that. It's really for going for the experience. So, I think group meditations can can be very helpful and uh, very useful. Is that was meditating on today's lesson? And uh, what I was going to say is that you know, at the academy, everyone does lessons from January 1st. And you know, I, mean, I feel that many millions of people are doing their lessons from January 1st and every day. So when I do my lesson in the morning, I'm group meditating <laughs> <laughs> with millions uh, of people around the world. <laughs> Yeah. This is a beautiful experience, you know, having that connection. And also, I was going to say, and, you know, that is a meditation, of course, doing the lessons. It's a total meditation, but it's an active meditation. If you were, you have these, these wonderful, like, incredible words <laughs> that bring you to this, this space. And it, it is incredible. So it's not, it's not even a form of meditation where, you know, you're letting your thoughts go to Eastern meditation. For me, it's an active meditation. It's a meditation of wow. Whatever uh, I am not a body, I am free. Uh, wow. I meditate on those words. <laughs> it's like incredible. You know, it's, it's an active meditation. So, okay. I didn't realize, I, I have not read the book, the book, of course, the book, but I didn't realize that people started the first of the year. So. Well, I mean, for me, I, I guess it's, all, it's a perfect, you know, whatever you do is perfect. Okay. But yeah, that's that's kind of logical. So it makes sense that you're kind of doing yeah, a disconnected, I mean, connected group. Connected with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Physically disconnected, but uh, in court. But obviously, you know, I always suggest to me, my suggestion is if you're going to start doing the, the lessons, you start from the first lesson. <laughs> and then, you know, after you finish that, if you want to just continue doing the lessons, and then you start to do it you know, from January 1st on, or wherever that day is. But I guess it doesn't matter. Everyone's happy. Yes. He didn't know 
Ken Watnick's organization, the foundation, has the daily lesson starting the first lesson one on the first of January online, and you can listen to it. Uh, just log it on to it. And I'll read it to you. You can listen to it over and over. That's great. That is a good symbol of, uh, again, synchronicities. And uh, I was just over in Spain, that's what they were doing. They you know, came out and said, oh, a lesson for the day. Uh, mother and two daughters, you know, all doing it synchronized. There are 365 lessons, so they can be done, in, uh, they're supposed to be done one after another, but a lot of people do them that way, starting on uh, January 1st, and uh, meet up with other people online or uh, in travels, and uh, sometimes <coughs> households or, or couples working them together like that can be a, kind of a, a good synergy, kind of just another symbol of, okay, we're, we're doing this together, and at times the ego wants mind to feel like it can't do it, might as well just throw in the towel. So these are all helpful symbols that, uh, you know, we're all in this together. So I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs>